How did this video make you feel? Were you disgusted, insulted, or provoked? Were you abjected? In 1982, Bulgarian French philosopher Julia Kristeva wrote a book called Powers of Horror, an essay on abjection. Her theory of abjection in Powers of Horror tries to explain what gives rise to horror and disgust in human beings, and why. Her approach highlights the use of abjection in literature, you know, like those creepy stories we've all told each other as kids to gross each other out. But the theory is rooted in philosophy and psychology, so we can use it to analyze our own gut reactions. The abject refers to the human reaction, horror, vomit, to a threatened breakdown in meaning caused by the loss of the distinction between subject and object, or between self and other. Hold on, let's break that down. Imagine you see a corpse. You might feel disgusted and scared. You might want to throw up. This is your body rejecting the presence of the corpse at a very basic level. Evolution has taught us to reject things like corpses because being around them might make us sick. But psychologically, Kristeva argues that being exposed to a corpse gives us a sort of dilemma. Here is something that was alive, but now isn't. It exists on the border of life and death. It's there, but it's no longer what it was. There's a breakdown in meaning as our minds try to understand the reality of this. And when we say, Oh no, that's disgusting, get it away from me. We are choosing not to be associated with it, which cements our existence firmly in the land of the living. In this way, abjection forces us to choose our identity. I reject the corpse. I am not the corpse. Kristeva explores food loathing as the most elementary form of abjection. She describes her intense and violent reaction to her lips touching the skin on the surface of milk that her family proffer her. Have you ever let a glass of milk sit out of the fridge? The skin that develops on top of the milk is something most of us try to avoid, because it also exists in that in-between state. The milk is supposed to be nourishing, but now there's this skin that's tainting it. Kristeva says she gags, her stomach spasms, and her organs shrivel up. When she rejects the milk, which is meant as a source of life and nourishment, she separates herself from her parents, who want her to drink the milk. As Kristeva explains, it's not the lack of cleanliness, or, in this case, the lack of freshness of the milk that causes abjection, but rather the way in which her horror and disgust disrupt what the milk means to her. Her mind struggles to place the skin of the milk because it exists between nourishment and decay. The implications of this, though, is that by rejecting what her parents try to give her, she is creating her own identity. She's separating herself from her family. There are many ways in which one can experience abjection. Some of the things Kristeva lists are the open wound, a corpse, shit, and sewage, among others. Disease, murder, amorality, and even small holes are some of the sources of the abject. The reason these things provoke such a strong reaction in us, Kristeva suggests, is because the abject has to do with what does not respect borders, positions, rules. The abject is a threat to our understanding of reality. So, shit and sewage are pretty tangible, disgusting things. But what about the more intangible gross stuff in our lives? I'm talking about morality. When we see something we perceive as unjust, we struggle to understand it, and we reject it. We might say, what's wrong with that person? I'm not like that. Most of us have had the unfortunate experience of having a close friend betray us. 
Kristeva says this kind of amoral action creates particularly strong feelings of abjection because we have to try to make sense of a friend who no longer acts like a friend. It's that in-between state again which forces us to pick a side. We might say, I would never do that. That's not who I am. Things get interesting when we talk about morality, because many of us have different values. For instance, there is a study called Discuss Sensitivity, Political Conservatism, and Voting that was done in 2011 that suggests that people who lean more on the right side of the political scale, that is, people who identify with more conservative ideologies, are more sensitive to disgusting things. This is because, while all people generally believe we should avoid doing harm and be as fair as possible, conservative-leaning people also believe in the importance of purity. We can't help what we feel disgusted by because it's connected to such an evolutionary part of our brains. So maybe we can consider this when we have our next political debates. Sometimes, however, Politicians can take advantage of our gag reflexes by exploiting our disgust for their political causes. Take Trump, for instance. Trump appealed to conservative notions of purity to justify his misogyny. When Trump wanted to criticize journalist Megyn Kelly for her line of questioning, he said, There was blood coming out of her you-know-what. He was attempting to use a bodily function to create disgust and revulsion instead of meeting her at an intellectual level. How abject. On October 1, 2017, a gunman opened fire into a large crowd from his hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada. This incident is now considered the deadliest mass shooting in recent American history, and the shooter's motive is still unknown. Theories about the killer became rampant in the aftermath of the shooting because so many people wanted to understand the why, the meaning behind the action. Kristeva says that any crime, because it draws attention to the fragility of law, is abject, but premeditated crime, cunning murder, hypocritical revenge, are even more so because they heighten the display of such fragility. The shooting in Las Vegas was premeditated. The gunman spent a lot of time planning it and purchasing weapons. His crime was abject. And as is often the case with these types of crimes, we label the perpetrator as a lone wolf. We distance ourselves. We reject them and their ideologies. We create our identities by expelling the other. And what about our day-to-day? -day? Does experiencing loss of meaning always have to be so extreme? Many of us have experienced spaces that lack meaning without realizing it. In the same way that rotten food presents us with a dilemma because it is at once potential nourishment and potentially dangerous, there are spaces that exist between two worlds. These are called liminal spaces. For instance, that staircase to your class or your job or your apartment is a liminal space. The tunnel under the highway is, too. The time you spend taxiing on an airport runway, a hospital waiting room. These are all places that are not about themselves. None of us purposefully hang out and grab a coffee in a clinic waiting room for fun. Liminal spaces exist in between meaning. They are through ways to another place. This is why it feels slightly worrying when we're awake at 3.30 in the morning while everyone else is sleeping or why abandoned buildings are so creepy, or why we might get a chill if we see an empty playground at midnight. We know the context that we're supposed to have for these places, but it's lacking. The usual meaning we've associated with these places has broken down, and we tend to try to avoid these places whenever possible because they are unsettling and even abject. Abjection, according to Kristeva, is a process by which we form our identities. We are presented with dilemmas, objects and places that straddle two worlds at once, like life and death, or nourishment and poison. When we see these things, we get a gut reaction, and we are forced to choose which side we're on. 
Maybe this is why so many of us love watching horror movies or reading scary stories. We can reject what we find repugnant, and we can get a better sense of who we are. I am not Pennywise, the dancing clown.